Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over today's UFC card strictly from a lineup construction perspective. Uh, for those of you that have been following these for the last several months, uh, this is what I've decided to do with respect to UFC content. Earlier in the week, we put out a, a plays video where we just go over what the best plays are using the metrics and pretty much all the information that everybody has access to. And when it comes to MMA, from a DFS perspective, I would say, I mean, it's stupid to put a number on it, but let's just say a huge amount of your success is going to be how you construct your lineups. And when you're trying to play the 150 max, which is what I like to do, it's even more important to make that distinction between what the good plays are and who you're actually going to play, you know? Um, and who you're actually going to play with who else are you going to play? Um, it's a really, really big difference. And when you're dealing with a 11, 12, 13 fight card where you have only, you know, 11, 12, 13 decisions to make, honestly, it's even more important. So I I enjoy doing it this way. And this is really for advanced players. Uh, people that like to use Saber Sim or other solver type products, other type of Sim products. So if uh, you know you just want the plays, you can go back to my earlier video, and 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 you can I'll tell you who the best plays are. I can actually tell you who the best plays are now. I mean, honestly, I, you'll want to play somebody from the. I mean, the best plays are somebody from the Ferreira Claus fight. Um, the fight's probably going to finish, and it's it's mid range. Um, Probably somebody from the um, – Ricky Simone's a really great play. I'll tell you that. Probably somebody from the Jim Miller uh, fight is probably a good play. Certainly somebody from Parsons Semmelsberger, specifically Parsons, is probably like an incredibly good play. Um, and then, you know, all these 9K guys are probably decent, but nobody's through the roof the best of them, so you probably want to, you know – maybe pick one or something like that, but there's really no difference between them. I mean, they all have good inside the distance lines. They all have pluses and minuses. Ankalev might not have the most necessary ceiling if it were only a three round fight, but he has five rounds to work with. Um, and that's pretty much the slate. You know, there's no straight up fades or anything like that. Nobody's awful. You might make the case that Weston Wilson just doesn't have enough win odds to justify being a decent play, but Everything else is just kind of normal, you know, but but those are the best plays. You know, someone in between the Ferreira Hawks fight, someone in the Semmelsberger Parsons fight, probably Parsons, uh, Ricky Simone, very, very strong play. And Jim Miller, extremely strong play. He's got good money line odds as well as a good inside the distance prop. So look, if you want plays, you go this. Uh, Miller, uh, either of these guys, Hawes or whatever, either of these guys, Parsons, um, and you're just kind of off to the races, okay? Then you could play, you can't play more than one, but you could play at least one of these guys at the top. Who do you want to play? Uncle Ev, for example? And you just kind of work from there. You are probably going to have to play somebody in the lower range, like Mata. Uh, he's 7K and he's got upside. Um, and that's probably where you're, you're, you're starting. But that's not exactly what we're doing here, okay? What we're trying to figure out is, given the fact that we know who the good plays are, and given the fact that most everybody else is going to know who the good plays are, how do you strike that balance between, you know, making good lineups and getting unique enough that you're not chopping it with, with 100 people when you are so fortunate as to get the optimal lineup? And that is that is really what keeps this, this game interesting for me. Um, as far as these sports go and what makes these sports much more interesting than NBA, for example, um, because, you know, this is, this is a, this is really, really interesting to me. So that's why I keep, keep working on this. All right. So I happen to use SaberSim to do this type of thing. Um, that's not to say that it's better than anything else. Really. I've never worked with the solver. I've never worked with, uh, what's it, the ACE, whatever that much. I've never worked with any other, other SIM products to the extent that maybe should. Um, I've used Roto Grinders HQ. I use Fantasy Cruncher. This is just the one that I I feel is the most advanced right now as far as giving you options and how to, you know, and what 
uh, on what you can do here. So I use this, and, and then I also have a few kind of mad scientist ideas of my own that I kind of play around with to try to get unique without getting too far off the board. And we're going to go through all of them today, or some of them today. So we're going to start, by the way, you have to start with a decent set of projections and a decent set of ownership. Um, right now, we're just going to use the Saberson ones. We'll make two, you know, two changes. I'm sure they're not going to mind this one time. Uh, what I'm personally going to do is I'm going to actually use my my own projections, which uh, and I can't really show you now. But suffice it to say, you know, it's a combination of the industry and my own takes and this, that, and the other thing. That's really not that important. Okay. What's important is once you do have a set of projections, wherever you go, it's like this, it's going to be a, very similar. Um, what do you do with them? So the first thing I want to do with Saberson is we're we're going to do a couple of Saberson tricks, and then we're going to do like one sheets trick, which I think is interesting. Okay, first some Saberson trips. First, we have to just start with something. So we're going to build 150 lineups uh, just with the normal. Well, actually, we're going to build 5,000 lineups with the normal GPP uh, 150 max settings. Okay, it's going to be 50,000 people in this thing, right? Let's make sure of that uh, more, maybe 39,000 people. Is that about right? No, it'll be more than that. Let me just see what that is. Just, just, just I forget. It's going to be 17,000 people in this. So let's just make sure that we put those settings um, correct. Uh, yeah, that's about right. Everything else keep the same. And we're going to build 5,000 lineups with these projections. Now, it's important to know what's going on here. It's building 5,000. And what it's doing, it's building 5,000 kind of high upside lineups based on these parameters, okay? Almost no correlation. Uh, ooh, sim diversity all the way to 10, which means it, it does... Um, it, it, it does prioritize ceiling, let's put it that way, in some way. The one thing I forgot to do is put don't use opposing posing fighters, but you almost never get them. So I think it's fine. And you could make the argument, by the way, that uh, you shouldn't click that. In other words, like if, 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 if it's a weird type of slate where the and you have two fighters that rate to really go after each other and get to a decision with both with both fighters scoring well um and that lineup would rate really well in a sim you don't want to eliminate it by rule okay so that is something you can consider one thing about mma by the way is that because it's only 20 fights and because it's a you know it's five thousand and all this stuff it is going to take a little bit of time to get this done. So I am going to pause this and then come back when this is uh, when this is finished. Okay, so we've built 150 lineups using those settings. And now the important thing to, to look at is how these lineups are being ranked. Because when you first look at this, you'd say, whoa, this is not really what I was expecting. You know, to see, you know, 54% Moda and, and say 37% Lapalus. And where, where, where is that great Phil Hawes play you talked about? Why is this only 10%, 13% owned? Why is Jim Miller only 10% owned? Why is Preston Parsons, who you said was one of the best plays, 0.7% owned? Why, why is this? Because it's important to know how these are being ranked by default. So we built, you know, 5,000 just lineups, Okay based on those 150, uh, 150 max settings. And it's listing them in this order by MMA default. Now, this is, when we when we dive into this Saberson thing, I can get into the, the weeds with this, but suffice to say, this is just about the most aggressive way to rank lineups that I've ever seen, okay? It, 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 it really prioritizes the 99th percentile outcome for these lineups. And it also really prioritizes um, uh, you know, low ownership. So if in fact you wanted 
lineups that people are not playing that have a small chance of winning, this is the, the ranking system that you are going to use, okay? And you're going to have to really have a lot of vision um, and faith to play like this. Um, um, so that is the first thing. And you could certainly do this. I, I have no problem with this. It might be a good idea to get into the weeds a little bit with how bad these lineups are relative to the others. In other words, it doesn't exactly do it this way. Um, I, it, once you rank them by the MMA default score, then it doesn't rank them by projection anymore. So, so it's hard to say really how close these guys are to being like terrible. Um, one thing you could do to combat that is instead of running, say, 5,000 lineups, you can run 2,000. You know, this way, um, even though you're going to rank them by this aggressive metric, you're at least only getting, at worst, like something in the top 2,000, where it's possible that with this and doing it this way, it's it's mathematically possible for you to be getting the worst 150 of the 5,000 from a projection perspective. Now, again... Who's to say that you want the top 50, you know, 150 projected lineups? We don't want that. Okay. We don't want the top 150 projected by median score. We want the ones with the high ceiling. We want the ones that people aren't going to be playing, you know, uh, if we're going to try to win the big cheese in these types of tournaments. Um, so I would say that right off the bat, you can start with this right now. I think that this is probably the most aggressive attempt to get unique that I can come up with, all right? The next kind of level to that is within this ranking system to increase your min uniques, okay? Um, to a point where it will still let you. Okay, so at min uniques three, it won't even give you 150, okay? So you would go back to min uniques too. Now, uh, I will shout out to um, Jordan from Saberson, who actually recommends to go even one back further. So let's just say you can get to min uniques five before you make a mistake. Then you can go to min uniques four. But here, if you're going to be really aggressive, the next step is to is to actually, well, the next aggressive would be to go to min uniques one. So the, the next step would be go to min uniques two, you know, a little less, you know, uh, concentration, okay? Um, the only thing I'd like to see for the hell of it is if you're actually getting... See, in these lineups, I can see that you're actually getting some lineups with both Ankalive and Walker because the the they add up to more than 100%, right? So you look at this and you say, Ankalaev see how many and then then walker yeah you, you're getting actually wow 26 lineups that have both walker and ankaliyev um and when so when you do that i mean you have to really consider if that's something that you want to do um if you want to blindly completely trust the system you should just do it anyway you know honestly um but I certainly wouldn't fault you if you went and rebuilt the whole thing without stacking, okay? Um, let's, um, we're going to save this this build. We're going to rename this. We're going to name this um, uh, Allow. This way we know this is the Allowing Opposing Fighters. And we're going to continue to work with this, okay, for now, right? So here we have MMA default, as aggressive as you want, as you can make it, min uniques two, and that's one thing you can do, right? And that's pretty aggressive. It's also pretty aggressive because I don't know how many people are actually stacking these things in GPPs. So in a way, it is getting sort of unique to do that. It's going to be hard to get there, but... I don't know. 
Um, the next thing we want to do before we get into like geomean filtering, which we can do, is let's look at the other way to typically rank these lineups. So now instead of ranking that 5,000 by um, MMA default, now we're going to rank it by kind of the standard aggressive yet, you know, yet reasonable, I guess the best way to describe it. Um, uh, Saber Sim rankings, that's by Sim Diversity 10. So now this is where you're getting, you know, the, how, how else do you want to put this? The quote unquote normal plays, you know, and Kalaev, Silva, you know, Basharat's a little, a little off the board, I guess. Basharat, uh, Ferreira, now you're getting the Ferreira and Hawes and these guys and, and Simone. So this is your normal type of build, okay? Now, if you do this, let's go back to Min Unique's wand. All right, so if you do this and put it in this way, in my opinion, you're going to be getting way too many dupes. That's just based on my back testing and my my opinion on this on this Saber Sim uh, build. Okay, the, the these settings, you just end up getting duped way too much. Now, now in fairness, you are you know gonna gonna hit the optimal more often doing this than not doing this, I guess. But you are not almost ever. I shouldn't say ever, but you're very rarely just doing this going to get unique enough to where I'd be comfortable playing a build like this in the 150. Okay. So you're going to have to do something with this. It's a little different. Um, so there are two things that, that, that you should do. All right. Well, one thing for sure. And that is we should at least start by employing the contest sims and, and, We've already pre-saved those in here. And you'll see that when we're playing this throwdown, we're dealing with a contest size of 17,647, uh, 33% and 20% entries paid. The one thing that you have to keep in mind is that it is using the Saber Sim ownership to calculate what the field is going to do. And that's a really important uh, presumption or assumption that you need to work through, okay? Because when you're running a contest sim, the whole purpose of that is to attempt to tailor your lineups to the actual contest you're playing by comparing your lineups or proposed lineups to the lineups that you think other people are playing. And if you don't get that, I won't say right, but if you're not, you know, if you're not doing a good job trying to get that right, then you're 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 kind of lost, okay? So. If you trust the Saber Sim ownerships, okay, then it's fine. If you prefer to do something else, like let's say that you had your own ownerships and you entered those into the, well, again, if you had your own ownerships, like if you wanted to, to do a better job of figuring out what the field is going to do except, except from straight Saber Sim ownership, what you could do is let's just say that I put my own projections in, I put my own ownership in and I then ran that 5,000 lineup build I did before. Remember with just the regular 150 max settings. Remember it started with a build. Okay. And remember we called it allow. So if we want, we could run our lineups kind of against ourselves instead of running them against the Saber Sim ownership lineups. And it's a little different. OK, um, and it might come up with different results. So that's a decision that you're going to have to make kind of on your own. But we'll, we'll you know, let, let's see the difference between the two. So let's let's first run our lineups against just the rate regular Saber Sim ownerships. So we will click on. Um, run contest Sim, and this this really shouldn't take too long. So I don't need to pause. I can I don't leave. And once that's done, remember, it's important to know what's happening here. So it's now it's now run the contest simulation. And then what you're going to want to do here is then click on the contest you're playing, which is the 150, and sort by 
let's use risk adjusted ROI. And now what it has done, it is now re-rated or re-ranked all of these lineups against that particular contest based on based on um, what Sabersim ownership implies the field is going to do, okay? Um, you will note, by the way, you're still getting this situation where you have this fight being, being owned and stacked in GPPs. Now, here, I mean, listen, if you believe that the Sabersim simulations and the contestants are doing what they purport to do, that it shouldn't matter. You know, that's already factoring in what these guys can score, you know, and what the rest of these guys can score and still thinks that it's a good thing to do to stack that. And it might be a good time for you to say, you know, I don't believe that. I'm going to rerun this with just with, – with not allowing fighters from the same caliber, okay? So now what we have is we, we've – now we have what I think is a little bit better than your straight Sim Diversity 10 – Okay. And this would be probably the minimum I would let you do in the 150 max to attempt to get unique. But I have to say that based on my own, you know, opinions and my, my back testing and my experience, this is still not enough. Okay. These types of lives are still not going to be enough to actually win enough in that 150 max. You're never going to win that, not never, but it's so rarely that you're going to get unique lineups from here. And like I said, it's so hard to get optimal anyway that I just don't think that this is going to be enough to attack the 150 max. Okay. So where where are we? Because where are we in this in this in this process? You know, we're trying to get a good portfolio of lineups. So what you can do is either use the MMA default. Or use these contest sim lineups, which are more reasonable, but you're just not getting unique enough. So what you then can do is literally force ownerships of these lineups such that they do rate to be um, to have low dupes, right? And that's when you use geo mean filtering. So all geo mean filtering is doing is is doing a, a kind of a product ownership thing where where we estimate how many duplications a particular ownership combination is going to produce given the size and you know the size of the field. So you have this calculator which you know I put on, I still threaten to put on the site but I haven't done it yet. And I already put in here what your input should be. So there's six players in every lineup. There's 17,000 entries in this tournament. And we're looking for, I mean, just to give you an example, let's just say that we're only looking for five dupes. I think that's reasonable. I mean, to search for all one dupe is just really, I mean, you're just not getting that. It's it's just it's just asking for trouble. Um, especially on a card like this, um, where I mean the favorites are pretty likely to win. So five dupes, the geometric mean which calculates for you that you're gonna need is about 25.7. You have to carry the, the decimal over here. So what you do is you take this contest sim build and then you hit add filter and you're then going to put geo mean 25.7 and it's then gonna show you only those lineups that have a 25.7 or less geo mean. Um, now, you see that you're going to get to stuff that, let's just put it this way, that you ain't going to like, okay? To, to, to that point, you'll see that in this, with this screen, you're getting 60% Weston Wilson. Um, all I can say is don't blame me. You know, the numbers are what they are. You're like, you might be thinking, well, he's only going to win the fight like 10% of the time. I, I get it. I understand. But ha have a little vision here, you know? Like, what happens when he does win that 10% of the time? When he's only owned by 6% of the people? When he is uh, fighting someone who's going to be extremely popular in Gene Silva? 
where when he does win, it becomes so much more likely that not only is he optimal, but it it's an optimal lineup that that has a shot to take it down by itself. Then maybe you can see why playing a lot of Weston Wilson, if your goal is to take it down by yourself, uh, if, is if your goal is to take it down by yourself, or at least within five dupes. And then you can you can say that you know what, <laughs> this is like my my DFS joke. You know, one good thing about having sixty percent Weston Wilson is that. 40% of your lineups are still live, <laughs> you know, so, so 60% of the time you're going to, you know, so not 60% of the time. So 60% of your lineups, you're going to be like, wow, that's awesome. You know, and that happens what 10% of the time. So you could say that 90% of the time, 40% of your lineups are live sort of, <laughs> uh, not exactly, but, uh, but this is, this is the role. This is the world that we live in when you want to get unique is you end up doing stuff like playing 60% West of us. And again, the other thing you can look at is that aside from him, everybody else is looks normal. You know, get lucky with one dude and this construction. And remember 10% is a lot. It, it really, really is. Um, so that's what you would get if you ran it in this way. Now, again, we, we also, there were other things that we did. Like we allowed for, multiple fighters now i'm curious if we actually get that in this bill i don't think so let's see let's see how many uncle with um walker are there here and there would be only well there would be a couple there'd be six but i will say this how cool would it be if you actually had a wilson lineup that came in and then all and then you're sitting there with just both guys in the main event you know anyway so we talked about using MMA default to get unique. That's one way to do it. We talked about using geo mean filtering to get unique, and that's another way to do it. There's one other trick, which I want to kind of just, just try with you guys, and, and it deals with leaving salary on the table. And here's my issue. My issue is that a lot of people think of this. In showdown, in, in any – in any DFS sport where there are not that many combinations and people are trying to get unique, the idea is, well, if everybody's going to leave money on the table, let's intentionally leave money off the table. The problem is it's very difficult to know exactly how much, you know, you could, you know, you make stuff up really say, Oh, but I'll leave a thousand on the table. I'll leave seven on the table. And I'm sure there are people out there smarter than I am that, um, that figure this stuff out. I have not. I know that uh, you you follow if you follow DFS uh, PhD online, he has a uh, kind of a, a cascading thing where he says, okay, after 48, 47, 49, then it goes down like that. That's you know that's way too advanced for me, honestly. Um, but so here's one trick that I'm going to lay, lay on to you, and I've just said this before about leaving money on the table, which is specifically applicable to this card. Um. And it will be applicable to all cards, if you think about it. I want you to take what you think is going to be a really popular underdog that you like. And, and there are, there's two that in this, that, that fit the bill here. One of them is Phil Hawes. And the other one is Preston Parsons. And we brought up both of them, Okay. Um, as really, really strong upside underdogs. They both have a, well, Hawes is a very strong inside the distance line for his price, and Parsons has a lot of wrestling upside for his price. So you have these two guys that are very popular underdogs. And, it, you know, if you play them, yeah, they're good plays, but everybody's going to play them. Um, so one thing you can do is this. So Preston Parsons, let's take, um, you know, let's take uh, Phil Hawes first. So he's 7,900, and you'll notice that he has a projection, a median projection, right, of 53. And we look at his opponent, who is Bruno Ferreira. He has a median projection of 64, like 11 points high. 
So here's here's the here's the 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 thing that you have to know is that you're going to be fighting with a lot of players in this GPP that use optimizers that run 150s. They don't necessarily saber sand. They just kind of put their projections and they, they let it roll. So my question is this. Let's say that you want to play that horse for error fight, which a lot of people are going to want to do. Okay, they are. A lot of people want to play the fight. There are people that are going to play 100% of that fight. And it certainly makes a lot of sense. But here's a question. Let's say that the computer blasts through all their lineups and then there's 80... 400 left or 8,300 left. And it hasn't calculated Pereira, Ferreira Hawes yet. Who's that lineup going to pick? It's going to pick Ferreira, right? Because Ferreira's got a 64 projection where Hawes is a 53. Now, again, we don't really care about the median projection. And I could argue that Hawes' upside is, is higher, <laughs> if not the same, as, as Ferreira. Um, so what I would suggest is that in lineups that you play Hawes to consider leaving 400 on the table or at least 400 on the table. You see what we're doing here? So, so we're playing Hawes, but now we're, we're also getting a little bit different because the lineups that have 8,300 left are more inclined to take Ferreira than Hawes, right? Because of the way math works. So if you take Hawes in lineups that leave 400 or more on the table, you're getting a little bit more unique with a with a with a with a with a play who might be a little bit popular. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. So you know, there's plenty of ways to do that. You can you know leave 400 on the table and run lineups. You can filter for Phil Hawes and you know only and and then also refilter for less than 49.6, which certainly makes sense. Definitely, that's that's one way to do it. Um, and it's only 400, so it's not as if you're giving up that much in other stuff, you know? Um, and likewise, the same thing you can do with, um, who is it? With Preston Parsons. So Preston Parsons is, is going to be a very popular underdog against Matthew Semmelsberger. And he's 600 points... Um, He's 600 points lower. So it's a little worse because they actually have Parsons with a higher projection than Semmelsberger. So I don't even know. The only person you're going to get an advantage with this technique in this situation are the people that max out south, like on purpose. You know, like if they don't leave, like for example, what is, what's the difference here between 84 and 78? So there's 600 left if you only use Parsons and not Semmelsberger. So unless, so if, if, if there's a lineup that's going to allow you to leave 600 on the table, then, you know, they're going to end up with Semmels with Parsons anyway, because he's got the higher projection. But if there are people that say, oh, I only want to leave 200 on the table, you're really not going to get to Parsons in lineups that leave 600. Okay. Um, you won't get to any lineups, right? If you're going to intentionally leave, uh, uh, intentionally going to max out salary. So this is a much weaker example of it. But the Hawes example is very, very strong in a situation like this. Um, other ones to look at, if you had a, if you if you had it, was like say that Miller fight. The problem is that Miller is just so much better play that. The eighth, the Benitez really isn't going to be particularly popular. The only other one I would think of, you know, I was going to say that that um, let's take a look at the ownerships. Actually, let's see what ownerships of, are of guys of underdogs rate to be pretty high. So okay, so thirty percent for Mario Batista. That's pretty. That's pretty expensive, right? The problem is, is that well, this is actually kind of interesting. So his opponent, Simone, is going to be super-duper popular, right? I don't believe this 29%. Well, actually, I do, only because he's a tremendous play. But as you see when you'll run lineups, it's not that easy to get him in. I, I can't really get into all of that, but fiddle around with the lineups a little bit. Like, and if you play Ricky Simon, you end up 
or Simone, you end up having to play these $7,200 guys you don't want to play. I'm just saying. Um, so just be careful at, at over-projecting the Simon ownership. Like, even though, like, he's a tremendous play with all of his upside, it is a little... For an $8,600 guy, it, it's, it's a little weird to try to get him in this week. So he might not be as owned as you would think. Okay? Um, however, so if you're getting Batista, and he's supposed to be 30% owned, if you want, you can play him and leave a thousand on the table. And that's rough. You know, that that's going to be a rough sell, you know, to do that. But if you get away with it, <laughs> uh, you're going to get a very unique build. Okay. So that's, I think, like, I think that's a bunch. I think it's a bunch of techniques that you could use on this card to combine both what we think are good plays and what we think, you know, are plays that we're supposed to play. Let's put it that way. Like the Weston Wills. Uh, shout out to Saber Sim to give us all these different options to fry our brains. Um, and uh, I guess that will do it. Good luck, everybody.